Thank you, John, for that uh, very kind introduction. And it's an absolute privilege to be part of this forum. And indeed, uh, back in what I think is an absolutely magnificent building from the outside. And um, I've presented in here once before at a health and safety conference, the level up above, and you're just aghast as you see the, the old world charm as you look in there. 1929 is when it was, when it was established. And just imagine for a moment that you're at that ribbon cutting ceremony in 1929 and someone threw the challenge to you to, you look out sea and you see the Newcastle of the, um, the, early, the early 1929 sort of period of time. Imagine what it's gonna be like as we enter the 21st century. Uh, I dare say that no one would have had any concept at all as to just how fast the world would have moved over that period of time. So as a little challenge, when you're walking out tonight after the presentation, just picture what you think it might be like in 2050. And that's part of the things we want to talk about today just to, to set the scene. It's also a privilege to be presenting alongside Eileen. I've known Eileen since 2006 as one of our outstanding board members in CSRO. And I've got to say, uh, for the Hunter region, there's not a stronger or a more persistent advocate of this region than, uh, than, than Eileen. So keeping in with the theme of this forum, what I was seeking to touch on really over about the next 20 minutes was just what are some of those global mega trends that we think will shape society, economy, the environment over the next 20 to 30 years period of time? Will have an impact for our planet, our country and for your region. And then look briefly at some of the emerging disruptive technologies that will also have an impact on, on our life. Um, let me start, though, for those of you who don't know CSRO, with just a very brief introduction. I'm not going to focus on CSRO, but just so we've all got a grounding. Um, and I'll only describe us through our mission and a couple of inventions, given we're talking about um, disruptive technologies. So effectively, our mission is to harness the best science nationally and internationally, whether it's working um, with our own internal scientists or the University of Newcastle or any other great universities in this nation, and then produce impact. Impact for uh, our industries to make them more competitive, impact for our governments to make their policies stronger and more robust, or impact for the well-being of the community that we live in. So it's a pretty straightforward uh, explanation as to what we do. We're all about great science, delivering impact and value. Um, much like this City Hall, we were established three years before then in 1926, so we've been around for some period of time. If you look at us through some of our inventions, and I'm happy to discuss any of these later, but Wi-Fi was an invention of CSIRO. We're pretty well known for the Wellbeing Diet book, which, is, which has had a pretty big impact on a number of people and, in fact, knocked the Da Vinci Code off being the number one seller when it was, when it was released. Uh, extended wear contact lenses, the polymer banknotes in your pockets are used in Australia but in excess of 20 other countries. A lot of people are wearing cotton today. Uh, if it's Australian cotton, it will have come from gene traits that CSROs work with the cotton farmers around the country. If it's US, then equally, there's a great chance that would be the same as well too. Uh, the recent Curiosity Mars landing was brought to you through our site in Tidbin Villa in partnership with NASA. And the original lunar landing was also brought to, to people uh, on Earth everywhere through CSRO facilities. Um, I could talk forever, but I won't on this. We also have a very proud uh, footprint in your region as well too. So that's the Newcastle Energy Centre, which was established in 2003. We have 130 people out there, again, working locally, nationally and internationally on some of the future energy challenges and opportunities. Um, we want to be an important part of this region. We think we are an important part of the region and we're not going anywhere. It's part of our fabric of, of CSRO and it's a terrific centre and the evolving partnership with um, University of Newcastle is outstanding as well. Let me move to the megatrends. Um, one thing about, and just a bit of background as to how they were developed. So we work with about 150 uh, com companies each, sorry, 1,500 companies each year across 80 different countries. And we're working on the one thing each time. That's about how you make the world better. What are some of the trends that are being seen over that period of time? So we worked with those partners, took the information, did some research ourselves, and then stepped back and said, what are those six 
mega trends. It didn't start with six, that's where it landed. What are the mega trends that we think will shape society over the next 20 to 30 years in terms of that social, economic, and environmental? So let me run through those mega trends and all of that. There's a fairly detailed brief online, and I'll give the website at the end of the presentation, but there's a nice brochure where you can actually read it and take it in your own course. So the first mega trend is probably not going to be a surprise to anyone. And the trends more from less. It describes a world where scarce water, energy, mineral, and food resources are, in, are facing increasing pressure from rapidly growing demand. So it comes both on the supply side and the demand side. Global population is growing, and so is economic growth is happening as well too, globally. It was only in 2011 that we welcomed our seven billion citizen uh, to Earth. It took. Um, 1,800 years, so it was in the year 1,800 where we had our first billionth citizen at that time. So it took 50,000 years to get to our first billionth. It'll only take another 13 to get to eight. So you can see the acceleration and the expectation is it'll level out sometime later this century at about 10 billion people as the sort of number. So rapidly growing population. World economies, particularly part of the developing world, are expanding uh, fairly rapidly as well too. So developing world, if you mean them all up, it's somewhere between about 4 and 5%. Some of the uh, more traditional economies are growing at around 2 to 3%. And obviously they're being updated as we go, but we've got a growing population base and a growing economic base as well. So let's now have a look at the supply side. So that's the demand on the side su supply side. Food security uh, is, where, without doubt, one of the biggest challenges that we face. Uh, one billion people hungry each day is what the FAO tells us. And whilst we need to increase output by 70%, agricultural output by 70%, over by 2050, the available acres and hectares to grow agriculture are decreasing by about 12 million hectares of agricultural land each year. So we clearly need to do more with less to feed the nation's, feed the nation's people. Water like food, we can't live without. Yet about 1.2 billion people don't have access each day to fresh and clean water to run their normal lives. Not sufficient anyway. Um, would be well known to this region, given many of your, your roots as to what you supply to the nation and beyond. But the world's hunger for energy continues to show no signs of, of abating at all. Global consumption is forecast to grow by a third by the year 2035. And although there's fairly rapid acceleration in renewables, it's off a very low base. And therefore, by that period of time, most of the energy will still be conventional, uh, sorry, uh, will, will still be the traditional combustion energy by that particular period of time. So the, pretend, the, the, the trend of producing more from less is dominating much, much of our thinking uh, going forward. I'm absolutely, I'm, I'm, despite what I've said there, I'm absolutely an optimist. History has said that man through innovation, people through innovation, through application of technologies can adjust, and we will adjust to that rising demand that's coming through. There's little doubt in my mind about that. We'll talk a little bit about that later. The second mega trend intentionally ends with a question mark, and it's called going, going, gone. And this explores, and I'll go to the question mark shortly, this explores the pressures on the world's biodiversity and ecological habitats. These assets don't sit on national balance sheet, but they clearly have very, very strong emotional and cultural value to people. Think of the Great Barrier Reef and how it's used and spoken about as by way of many example. In recently reading some work by some Stanford Uni, uni professors, it, it hit home just how much responsibility we have on our shoulders at the moment. Now, even if their finding is half true, it puts amazing weight on our shoulders and they say, the fate of bio biological diversity for the next 10 million years will be determined over the course of the next 50 to 100 years by the activities of a single species. And clearly they're talking about us in terms of the actions we take over the next 50 to 100 years will have long-standing, long-standing impacts over a long period of time. So they would conclude that if the wrong action is taken, much of the natural world that humans value and depend upon is at risk of being lost forever. However, there's a positive story to this. Again, um, I'm presenting this with my view that I'm optimistic about our future and a bright light. 
So whilst we're seeing decline in some areas, we're also seeing the public, government and company responses lifting over the course of the last decade as well too in response to that. And I deplore the, those, those, um, those involved in companies in the audience today who were taking positive efforts uh, to look after those particular habitats. So the reason we've got the question mark at the end is we don't know the answer yet. Uh, it's as simple as it depends on what we do from here forward, we over the course of the next 50 to 100 years as to what we leave for those who follow us. The Silk Highway is the third mega trend. Up to the top uh, left hand picture, so top right hand picture as you see it there, this is a particularly pr profound plot that you may not be able to see too readily, but what I'll do is talk about it. It took, so if we go back to around zero AD, the centre of eco eco economic power effectively sat over North Asia from that period of time right to about 1000 AD. It then shifted over a very, very long period of time, somewhere over the North Atlantic between Europe and the US. It's coming back at an absolutely outstanding rate of speed. So it's the rate of speed that change here that's, that's just so different. Um, estimated by, uh, those estimates by um, uh, McKinsey's estimate, it's moving about 140 kilometres a year back to where it was back in 1000 AD or a zero AD. So many of you will know and see these mega shifts happening and we were talking at the back table before just around the recent uh, PM's delegation to China of which this region was represented very well. A number of your resource companies were there just exploring deeper and further opportunities in China and Asia. I'm seeing it in my own industry um, of science, research and innovation. We're seeing these dramatic shifts. Uh, China has got now more researchers than the United States. They're ramping up the league tables at an absolutely outstanding rate. Uh, scale is increasing amazingly. Quality is lagging, but increasing at an amazing rate as well too. CSIRO will continue to engage with the powerhouses in Europe and North America, and our largest country-to-country -country partner is North America. Uh, our largest individual organisation par partner, if we talk about co-publications, is the Chinese Academy of Sciences. That wasn't the case just five years ago. It's been a dramatic shift, although we've had a partnership in China for 40 years. It just sees the future. So you can see the whole shift in political and economic power shifting over the period of time. This next mega trend uh, fascinates me and it's obviously been a great subject of debate in our country over the course of a period of time that's really come into the crosshairs over the course of the last, just the last few days. And it's forever young. It describes a world of rapidly shifting demographics that'll shape the future. Again, um, the world's getting older. So in 1950, 8% of global population was above 65, 8%. In 2011, it was a bit over 11%, and the estimates are it'll be 22% by 2050. So that's amazing shift in demographic just over the course of a century where we've nearly tripled the number of people proportionately uh, that, are over, that are over 65. Let's now talk about Australia. Uh, life, expectancy, life expectancy in this country is also increasing fairly rapidly due to a number of things, advances in medical science, lifestyle shifts, nutrition, uh, access to healthcare and the like, just to name a few. In 1900, if you're a male in this country, you'd expect to live for about 51 years and a female 55 years. A um, hundred years later, in 2000, that lifted to 77 for a male and 82 for females. That seems a bit of a, that's a significant jump over that period of time. By 2050, it's expected to be late 80s for males and early 90s for females. So again, a fairly dramatic shift. The topic of working uh, has come up again over the last 24 hours into a fairly acute focus. What the facts tell us is that in, 19, in 2010, we had about five people working in the workforce for everyone over 65. We had seven and a half people in the workforce in 1970 for everyone over 65. The projections are we'll have 2.7 in the workforce for everyone over 65 by 2050. So again, this is just what the plain demographic chips tell us. And it obviously has fairly broad social, economic, 
um, uh, consequences if we think about the interplay between social security and retirement savings, healthcare and economic investments, just to name a few. Um, a little story, if I may, just again to demonstrate how things are changing. My wife works in the aged care sector. She loves working in the sector. She's been in there for a long period of time. And she was talking to a lady in one of the facilities that my wife's name's Erica, that Erica oversees. And this lady, last February, had her 70th birthday. And she was expressing to Erica that, I hope I'm here until I'm 75, is what she said. Now, that, that, that's probably not an unusual story. You're probably saying that's relatively young. The difference is this lady was the director of nursing. So she was actually running the facility and she wanted to be there until she was 75. I know the lady well, and she, you wouldn't pick her as a 70-year-old. One of Australia's leading scientists is a guy called Jim Peacock, previous chief scientist of this country, works with CSIRO today and has for a long period of time. Jim's in the most productive years of his scientific life at the moment, and he has real potential to have massive breakthroughs in the field of plant, biology, and agriculture. Tim, uh, Jim is tapping the door of being 75 as well. So again, it's the options that we think about to provide for employees, some of them hitting the prime of their ability to be able to contribute to a working life. How do we adjust the working conditions that we have for people in our organisations to assist them to add, add lots of value? The fourth mega trend and we see this in every day of our life is virtually here. So everything exists in the real world has a virtual counterpart, an avatar, if you like. Again, I'd just ask you to turn your clock, your minds back to say a decade this time. No one would have anticipated, I certainly wouldn't have, it would have been a rare person who did, uh, the growth in social networking that's happened over that period of time. There's a range of technologies have come together to do that. But let's consider China at 1.3 billion people, India at 1.2 billion people, the US at just over 300 million people. Today, Facebook, Skype, Twitter, all have members than our third largest country in the world. It's just been absolutely, again, profound, the growth in social networking that's been realised by a whole range of innovations and technologies that have sorted that. And these, these changes are introducing and goes to the theme of this particular, this particular mega trend, new ways of working, connect, connecting, delivering service, transacting, shopping. You know them as well as I do, educating people. You know, we've got some people from the University of Newcastle here. They will have a, an acute focus on how do you actually get people to online, become online educated as part of, a part of the work they're doing. So it offers lots of power, but it offers some risks as well too. Cyber security uh, is a risk. Virtual crime is a risk as well too. So if you're in the health services sector at the moment, you're worried about the integrity and holding on to patient data, just as a way of around that cyber security side. But there's some significant advancements. Let's, let me provide just a short example from some work that CSRO is doing. So we're working with the Queensland government and some of the Queensland hospitals about how you monitor and support people in post-cardiac surgery. And what would normally happen post-cardiac surgery is there'd be a follow-up generally each day for the individual to go back into the surgery, have their vital signs taken, make sure they're OK, and then send them home again. Now, the compliance rate of doing that was about 47%. So despite going through some form of cardiac surgery, less than half the people thought it was worthwhile to go and get that done. So we developed in partnership with the Queensland government and the, the hospitals up there an iPhone app that allowed you to report in, and obviously some other infrastructure, allowed you to report in your pulse, your uh, other vitals, temperatures, and, and, uh, and a range of other things. Not only did the health outcomes be the same or be improved by that is what we've had reported, the compliance went up from 47 to 80% just by giving people access to facilities in their home to be able to do it. So we've evolved to a world where communication uh, is cheap, communication is global. So again, if we turn the clock back just 10 years, if you, if you earned a thousand times the salary of someone else, you had access to information and data they couldn't even think of. Now, anyone who has a smartphone, any sort of like 18-year-old or 17-year-old with the holes hanging out of the back of their pants, 
They've, many of them have the same access to information as you have as, as industry leaders or government leaders or innovation leaders in your particular space. You might have some specialised stuff. But it's also created a world where everyone has a voice. So previously, if you'd stood and put your hand up in a small region, you, often your voice wasn't heard outside this region. Now you can be heard globally for what you're doing. The final one is, is Great Expectations. And it talks about really is building on the back of adding three billion middle class people over the course of, particularly through Asia, over the course of the next uh, several decades. There's a growing demand uh, for great expectations, consumer products and experiences. Uh, let me talk about an example as to how Coke, the global company, played this out. So they ran a share at Coke program where they did something pretty simple and that was to put names on Coca-Cola bottles. They produced 378,000 different custom bottles around the world, advertising online, billboards, social networks and the like. They attribute that campaign to lifting, lifting their, their consumption by 7% over the summer where that particularly applied because people wanted to go grab their own name on, a Coke, on their Coke bottle. So they got to the point where they'd met the great expectations just by some mass personalization. So as you all know, personalization is an old commerce. It's been with us for a very, very long period of time. But mass personalization is a whole new game that can leverage off the back of innovation, technology, knowing your customer, having great data and great data analytics to be able to do that. So you might note um, that I said up front, I'm an optimist, and I am. Although the world's changing faster than ever before, our innate ability of humans to innovate, to problem solve and adapt, has created an absolute exponential world as we move through. And we're seeing the shifts in the business models and the proliferation of great innovations shortening their life cycle. So let's take an extreme example. It took 5,000 years for agriculture and writing to diffuse itself across effective, effectively Europe and Asia lands over that period of time. The printing press took 100 years to diffuse itself across, across those particular systems. Uh, the PCs, World Wide Web, took about 14 years for large-scale diffusion across the system. Social network took about six years. These business cycles are becoming shorter and shorter, and we need to be able to position ourselves to respond to that. It's clear, and you'd probably say I would say this, and I will say this, that science, innovation, and technology is driving a lot a lot of this, which on the supply side drives some of those, those particular changes. Just in the last few minutes, I'd like to talk about some of those... Sorry, that's the right one there. Some of those disruptive technologies. So I've just tried to pull out, to provide an example of some of those that you'd be well familiar with that have provided an absolute step change to the way that people live over the period, over a period of time, so whether it's railway, whether it's um, access to high-speed data, so your smartphone, and that's relying on high-speed data, whether it's through vehicles, whether it's through the first computers that came out, these have absolutely been disruptive technologies. It's much harder to look at the future and pick what some of those disruptive technologies will be in the future. So often you see them as they're just coming on to the market. But let me provide three just brief examples. Um, so we've been aware of the internet for some period of time, but the internet of things is again a paradigm shifter. So it's a network of low cost sensors, very low cost, low weight, low intrusion center, sensors that allows to develop major networks across whatever we do. So large US retailers, for example, are using RFID technologies and sensors to manage inventories and supply chains. Uh, we're working on technologies of clothing and clothes, we actually got sensors on clothes, can monitor your own, own vitals, temperature, comfort levels and the like, and then potentially automatically adjust. This is about the internet of the internet. You can see many, many examples in healthcare as well too. So the, the bottom talks about the next generation of gen genomic, genetic and genomic technologies effectively. The ability to cheaply and very rapidly determine the individual makeup of individuals, of animals, of plants, and then 
determine ways to actually lead to better and faster ways to diagnosing diseases and treatments. You can see the same rolling out in the ag space as we look for more productive agriculture. Um, but what I want to say now is that to get a disruptive technology out there, it really needs widespread use. So it's no good developing a great technology in CSRO in a university lab and it's sitting in the corner. That's not disruptive technology. Society needs to be ready and willing to accept it. So there's social consequences that come into play as well too. So we have to align society's expectations, what they're willing to receive or not receive, so the science and technology doesn't get too far ahead of where the social acceptance will be. It'll always be a little bit nudging ahead. But it only really becomes disruptive when there's widespread application. And to do that, you need at least that pull from the, pull from the individual to say, we're willing to use this product, and you need a technology that's ready to be, ready to, to be deployed. So as we reflect on the mega trends and the disruptive technologies, it's, it's absolutely clear that we're, on a, we're at a unique point in our history. We've just spoken about how we're bringing those chains together. We're standing at the front end of mind-boggling change. So one of my backgrounds is as a meteorologist. So I've done a bit of work around cyclones and how you predict cyclones. And to me, it's, it's a bit similar there. You can see the cyclone forming. You know it's going to form. You don't quite know where it's going to finally flash up and where it's going to impact but you just know it's going to happen. You can see it and you can't predict its full path. That's where we are here. These mega trends, many of them are as honest today and we need to be responding today to those mega trends, but we don't quite know where they're going to hit. So we stand in summary on the cusp of a more connected world, a world where the virtual will stand alongside reality, a world where the centre of gravity is shifting more towards our region, towards the Asian region, a world where the diversity of genes, species and ecosystems will depend on the actions of one species, that's ours. A world where we age will strive to remain young over that period of time. A world where we must produce more for less for more people and where everyone will have great expectations. So again, I just thank you for your time and remind you of that challenge. When you stop and walk out of this auditorium today, just take a minute to think, what will Newcastle look like in 2050? And that's part of your thinking over the course of the next couple of days into Saturday anyway. So thank you very much, John, for your time.